babe. That was stunning. Thanks. Can't believe it's been over three months since we released it. It only seems like yesterday. Time's just flown by. It's crazy, really. Fern, you get any more hit singles up your sleeve for me for the next album, then? I might have. But don't keep them to yourself. Share the love. <laughs> oh, what was the opportunity about, anyway? I always meant to ask, but we're always so busy running from gigs and interviews and whatever. I either just completely forgot or never found the time. It's about making choices in life. Like, when I chucked my job at the accountancy firm, it was really tricky, but I knew I wanted to focus on my music and that that was what I wanted to do in life. So, are all of our songs about your choices in life, then? <laughs> all right, Missy, calm down. Blimey, don't get your knickers in a twist. It's not all about you, you know. Jeez, give the poor girl a chance. Actually, Fern, have you got the chords and lyrics to that song you played me the other day? Because that should definitely be our next single. You should try it, Bex. It's really good. Oh. When are you going to tell them? They won't get it. They might be up for it. You never know. I love this, hun. <laughs> Especially this line about women being like breeding stock. <laughs> Where the hell did you get this from? <laughs> Just go on. Go on what? Well, I don't know if you guys would believe me if I told you where the inspiration was coming from. Jane Austen. What? <laughs> Jane Austen? Are you having a laugh? Only partly from Jane Austen. Marcus, have you ever actually read Jane Austen? No, and I don't plan to either. I would I want to read about loads of people dressing up in silly costumes and talking in old English that nobody understands. Mm. Oi! That is bang out of order. Just because it is not your thing doesn't mean that it's rubbish. You haven't even heard the song yet. What's so? <laughs> Fern. Uh, but um, not all of your songs have been influenced by Jane Austen, right? Well, they do all have the same connection. You know, like a concept album? Which is... No, no, I actually want to know. Really? Yeah, I think it's uh, kind of cool. <laughs> well, I don't. Bex, come on, let us speak. The songs aren't about Jane Austen, just about some of her characters created at a special time in her life. Which was when? When she was dying. <laughs> this just gets better. <laughs> she realised she only had months to live and worked out the best way to spend them were writing, writing something that might encourage others to write, thinking particularly of her niece Anna and her nephew James. Basically, she wrote the foundations of a story, a sort of challenge for anyone who thought they were clever enough to complete it to complete it. So what happened? Her niece Anna could write good dialogue, but had no idea about how to create situations or build characters. So when she inherited the manuscript in 1845, she wrote a continuation but was unable to complete it. And Look, hasn't this one already been on TV? No, <laughs> because it wasn't finished. Although many people tried to finish it as a book, Anna at least knew what was going through Jane's mind when she was writing it, because it was for her that the piece was initially intended. Anna knew that it was meant to be a satirical comedy. Far too satirical to be published in 1817. <laughs> so satirical, in fact, that, that the Austen's original wasn't published in full until 1925, in this little book. Fern, we are a pop rock band. Thank you. If people find out we'd be getting inspiration from Jane Austen, they'll think we're some sort of big joke. Well, not necessarily, Bex. I mean, come on, we can write about the modern take on it, about things we have now that we never had then. Look, what Fern is trying to say is, as Austin intended, just take what she wrote and use our imaginations. You've known about this the whole time, haven't you? Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, I actually think it's a great idea. But I think we should try it. Come on, what have we got to lose? Our street cred for one. Oh, yeah, shut up, yeah. Marcus. Stop being such a misery guts. Come on, give it a try. I bet you were tenor, you'd love it.
Yes. I don't think I'm giving you a tenner yet, though. I will have your money by the end of this song. Right, come on. Get on with it. You know you want to. I cannot believe I'm about to sing a song about Jane Austen. What do you mean, the whole range of human emotions? Hmm? You're a pop group. What you do is write Taylor Swift songs. <laughs> yeah. I think we're better than Taylor Excuse Swift, me? Well, take the next song, for example. It's about death. Death? Oh. Actually, have any of you guys seen the film The Bucket List? No. no. Well, it's about three unlikely characters who were told that they were dying of cancer. Okay, mm. bear with me. So what they did, they found out they only had a limited, um, limited amount of time left to live. So they wrote up a list of everything they wanted to do before they, you know, kicked the bucket. <laughs> Things like skydiving, mountain climbing, uh, making peace with people you've become estranged to. So you're um, telling me that Jane Austen decided to go skydiving and mountain climbing? <laughs> <laughs> no, better. She worked out a way to become immortal. <laughs> When did you realise that your life would soon come to an end? Did you always know your life would be so short? What is a life? What is it worth? Is it what you leave behind you?
She's got characters, she's got props, the lot. Oh, amazing, it sounds great. Can I see it? Whoa, 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 whoa. hang on. Hang on. I thought I was a bassist in a pop rock group, not a drama queen. <laughs> Could have fooled me. <laughs> well, look, I can see where Marcus is coming from. We're a pop rock band, not a drama group, but I mean, there can't be any harm in reading it through and giving it a go. I mean, up until now, it's where most of Fern's inspiration for our hits has come from. We didn't even know. It might help us understand the songs a bit better and. I can't believe I'm about to say this, but it might actually be a good laugh. So, I'm in. Yes! <laughs> Fine. So if I see any of this on Facebook, that includes you, Alex. I'm done. <laughs> New Sanditon is a sea bathing resort on the south coast, offering cures for invalids a measured mile closer to London than Eastbourne. Tom Parker is speculatively building new lodging houses, but the resort has few visitors. It, it needs a clever surgeon, maybe uh, a big attraction like a clever surgeon who could offer miracle cures. In search of a surgeon, Mr. and Mrs. Parker's journey isn't as simple as they may have hoped. Their carriage overturned and Tom has sprained his ankle. Good afternoon. My name is Haywood, Jack Haywood at your service. That's my house over there. <laughs> Can I grant you any assistance? Really? <coughs> Take time. You! Okay, look, I'm not used to this. Right. You are extremely obliging, sir, and I take you at your word. The injury to my leg is a... The injury to my leg is, I dare say, very trifling, but it's always best in these cases to get a surgeon's opinion. Uh, I need not ask whether I see his house. I'll thank you to send one of your good people for the surgeon. What, sir, are you expecting oh, to say? I can't take this anymore. I can't take this anymore. Jeez. Where is Look, it? if I'm doing it, you're doing it. <laughs> What? Just, just put it oh. on. I'll hold that. <laughs> <Put it on. laughs> right. <laughs> Make some effort. What, sir? <laughs> Are you expecting to find a surgeon in that cottage? We have no surgeon in the parish, I assure you. I, I, I'm sorry to have the appearance of contradicting you, sir, but... Whether from the extent of the parish or of some other cause, you may not be aware of the fa- But stay, can I be mistaken in the play? Is this not Willingdon? Am I not in Willingdon? Yes, sir, this is certainly Willingdon. Uh, then, sir, I can bring proof of your having a surgeon in the parish, whether you may know it or not. Ah, uh, here is an advertisement that I cut out myself from the Morning Post in the Kentish Gazette just yesterday morning in London. Sir, I think you'll be convinced I'm not speaking at random when you read it. Sir, if you were to show me all of the newspapers printed in one week throughout the kingdom, you would not convince me there being a surgeon in Willenden. I believe I can explain it, sir. Your mistake is in the place. There are two Willendons in this county, and your advertisements refer to the other, which is Great Willenden and lies seven mile off. In the absence of a surgeon, 
Jack Haywood insists on attending to Tom Parker and his sprained ankle. During the Parker's two-week stay with Jack Haywood and his family, Tom takes great interest in telling Jack all about Sanderton and the benefits it would bring its visitors. It's a fine speculation that will benefit the nation. A place for invalid recuperation. Contemplation, time and joie de vie. <laughs> it's been marked out by nature with its hard sand and deep water just ten yards from the shore. With its finest breeze and bathing white cliffs so near to London, no mud, no weeds or shiny rocks. It's Sanditon, favoured by nature and chosen by man. Sanditon, roll out the bunting and strike up the band. It's not evil, like Brighton, Thanks. Worthing and Eastbourne. It's Sanditon, favoured by nature and chosen by man. There's some new place by the sea it Starts up each year Like Brinshaw Grow in the fashion But how can half of them be filled? Where are the people with money Who would want them? Bad for the country The poor made good for nothing And devaluing the poor Brinshaw, Brinshaw, it's just a stagnant marsh, a bleak moor, and the constant effluvia of putrefying seaweed, insalubrious air, brackish water, and bad tea. That's true, actually. Soil so ungrateful, it, it cannot, cannot yield a cabbage. It's a fine speculation that will benefit the nation A place for invalid recuperation Contemplation, time and choix de vie It's been marked out by nature with its hard sand and deep water Just ten yards from the shore With its finest breeze and bathing white cliffs so near to London With no mud, no weeds or shiny rocks it's Sanditon, favoured by nature and chosen by man. Sanditon, roll out the bunting and strike up the band. It's not evil like Brighton, Worthing and Eastbourne. It's Sanditon, favoured by nature and chosen by man. Alex, I told you no Facebook. Not, I'm not doing this. Um, in, in, in gratitude for the Haywards' hospitality, the Parkers invite Charlotte, eldest daughter of the Hayward family, to spend the summer with them in Sanderton. Charlotte looks forward to this visit, but like any young person been sent on a trip by their parents, she must wonder, will there be anything to do? Will I make new friends? Sanditon has miles of sandy beaches And a fishing port upon a sparkling stream With the noblest expanse of turquoise ocean Between the South Bore and Land's End A hotel, a billiard room, the library and the terrace There is so much in this place for me
title went to her nephew called Sir Edward. He lives at Denham House with his sister Esther. But by holding all their purse strings, the Dowager Lady Denham keeps them both in check. Come and bathe. But what is needed is my brother, uh, Sidney, a clever young man with great powers of pleasing, a neat equipage, a sense of humor, and a highly fashionable air. His arrival with some friends is expected soon. there be for Charlotte in the Sanditon Sea Bathing Resort of 1817? Well, in modern day terms, very little. There was no TV, cinema, team games, physical recreation. Charlotte might engage in needlecraft, play the piano, and in company <laughs> go for long walks to visit society people in their houses. But she could read. That's why books were so important. And why one of the first things that Mr. and Mrs. Parker did is take Charlotte to Mrs. Whitby's subscription lending library. Right. <laughs> so here we are in Mrs. Whitby's subscription lending library, very much where it happens in our new seaside society. To see you again, Mrs. Whitby. But this is Charlotte Hayward, our guest for the summer. She helped us out when things got tricky. And here are all the novelties and fancies that any heart could want. All the books you could desire. Just five shillings a quarter. We want to change our books. What are the latest books? Books for all our days. In our different of Shelley's Frankenstein Or her husband's hint to intellectual beauty Books, books, books Factual, poetic Creepy, gothic, fantastical Cautic, romantic We want to escape books We want to learn books Books for all our days In our different ways We want to grow All the literary hits of 1817 and 18. Yeah, that's clear. But we've run out of people to play these parts. But this is theatre. You just throw on a different bonnet or wig or waistcoat and you play the next part on the list. Fine. Oh, okay. All right, well, just chill out for a minute with your hats and bonnets and waistcoats and stuff. What is it that happens at the next part of the story at Tom and Mary's house? Page 57 in the little book. Not a line from Sydney. He is an idle fellow. I sent him an account of my accident at Willingdon and thought he would have vouchsafed me an answer. Uh, but perhaps that implies he is coming himself. I trust it may. Uh, but here is a letter from one of my sisters, uh, Diana. 
I believe. You all have heard us mention frequently how bad her health is, and they're, very, they're subject to a variety of serious disorders. Uh, and our youngest brother, who lives with them and is not much above 20, well, he's almost as bad an invalid as themselves. He's so delicate that he can engage in no profession. Uh, Sydney laughs at him, but really it is no joke, though often he makes me laugh in spite of myself. Uh, now, if he were here, he'd place money on either Diana, Susan or Arthur appearing at the point of death within the last month by this letter. Oh. Right. No chance of seeing that Sanderton, I'm sorry to say, a very indifferent account of them indeed. Seriously, a very different in town. Uh, Mary, you'll be quite sorry to hear how ill they've been, and, and are. I think we should all be acquainted with what she writes. My dear Tom, so grieved at your accident, but so well attended by the Haywards. I would have been with you the moment I heard, but was suffering from spasmodic bile, and could hardly crawl from my bed to the sofa. Many thanks for looking for an apothecary on our account, but we are entirely done with the whole medical tribe. We have consulted physician after physician in vain until we are entirely done with the whole medical tribe. They can do nothing for us, and we must now trust to our own knowledge of our own wretched constitutions for relief. <laughs> but if you think Sanderton needs a medical man, I will undertake the commission with pleasure and have no doubt of succeeding. For together, we must by now have the knowledge of every physician in the south of England. As for getting to Sanderton, we are all quite incapable of travel. In my present state, the sea air would probably be the death of me. I doubt whether Susan's nerves would be equal to the effort. She has been suffering much from the headache, and six inches a day for ten days together relieved her so little that we thought it right to change our measures. And being convinced that much of the evil lay in her gum, I persuaded her to attack the disorder there. She has accordingly had three teeth drawn, and is decidedly better, but her nerves are a good deal deranged. She can only speak in a whisper and fainted away twice this morning on poor Arthur's trying to suppress a cough. He, I am happy to say, is tolerably well, though more languid than I like and I fear for his liver. <laughs> Sydney had a scheme to visit the Isle of Wight, but we have not seen or heard from him. We wish you every success for the season, and through the recommendations of our wide circle of friends who suffer as grievously for their ailments as ourselves, we have persuaded two large families to visit Sanderton. One, a rich West Indian family from Surrey. The other, a most respectable boarding school or academy from Camberwell. Yours most affectionately, Diana. <laughs> It's not something that I can control. It's in my genetic make. Fossilization procrastination. All the crosses I must bear.
identical depression that makes people think we're bad. Their voices are so compelling, phony treatments we are checking. They just don't understand how really sick we are. experience of Sanditon was meeting Lady Denham and her nephew by marriage, Sir Edward Denham. Now, Lady Denham has some forthright things to say on virtually every topic. And Tom is quite keen on the prospect of having a West Indian family coming to visit Sanditon, as no people spend more freely. Lady Denham's opinion is, they have full purses. Oh dear. Mum? Yes? Can you come up and do this bit? Oh, what? Can we involve our mums now? Uh, She's not even in the band. This bit, is yeah, yeah, uh, there. Oh, yeah, there you go. Oh. Give it a try. <coughs> they have full purses. Fancy themselves equal, maybe, to your old country family. But then, they who scatter their money so freely. Never think of whether they may not be doing mischief by raising the price of things. And I have heard that's very much the case with your West Indians. <laughs> that was really good. Do you know what? I think you might have the right voice for it. She's great, isn't she? Right, you can go, you can go sit down, but don't go off making any tea because we are going to need you again soon. Whatever you say, dear. Oh, that's great. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. I love some of these clashes with Charlotte and Sir Edward. Um, Alex? Alex, come here, read some of this story with me. It's brilliant. Oh, should we book? Yeah. To walk with so fair a maiden on this cliff, to view the sea and its shore, to feel the emotions they summon, the terrific grandeur of an ocean in a storm, its glassy surface in a calm, its skulls and its samphire, its abysses, its quick vicissitudes, its dreadful deceptions, its mariners tempting it in sunshine and overwhelmed by the sudden tempest. It is just poetry. Whilst on the subject of poetry, what do you think of Burns's line to his Mary? He meets the woman he pursued, having already made two other women bear his children. <laughs> what a ledge. Marcus. I've read many of Burns's poems with great delight, but I'm not poetic enough to separate a man's poetry entirely from his character. Yes. With Burns is there is pathos to madden one. If ever there was a man who felt it, it was he. Montgomery has all the fire of poetry. Wordsworth has the true soul of it. Campbell, in his pleasure of hope, has touched the extreme of our sensations. Like angels visit, few and far between. Can you conceive anything more subduing, more melting, more fraught with the deep sublime than that line? But Burns, I confess his sense of my preeminence. If Scott has a fault, it is the want of passion. Tender, elegant, descriptive, but tame. The man who cannot do justice to the attributes of a woman is my contempt. I wonder what you mean by the attributes of a woman. Oi, oi. <laughs> Burns's known irregularities interrupt my enjoyment of his lines greatly. I have difficulty in depending on the truth of his feelings as a lover. I have not faith in the sincerity of the affections of a man of his description. He felt, he wrote, then he forgot. But can any woman be a fair judge of what a man may be compelled to say, write or do by the sovereign impulses of a limitable ardour? I'm pretty sure that's the Harvey Weinstein excuse. <gasps> I think I recognise this situation. I've had a few dinners with would-be boyfriends, but if I wasn't so irritated, I think I'd have died of boredom. <laughs> i 
Lefroy, how mean Lady Denham is to her dead husband's nephew, Sir Edward Denham, and his sister. As she explains to Charlotte, oh, Mum, we're going to need you again. Where oh, is she? Coming, dear. Oh, oh blimey. <laughs> oh, I see you're oh. getting into character. Oh, you're right. what, what do you mean? Nothing. You look great. Oh. Nothing. Uh, Where are we? We are there. Oh, here. Yes, my young folks, as I call them sometimes. I had them with me last summer about this time for a week, from Monday to Monday, and very delighted and thankful they were. I would not have you think that I only noticed them for poor dear Sir Harry's sake. No, no, poor dear Sir Harry, between ourselves, thought at first, to have got more. But he is gone, and we must not find fault with the dead. Nobody could live happier together than us, and he was a very honourable man, quite the gentleman of ancient family. And when he died, I gave Sir Edward his gold watch. He did not bequeath it to his nephew, my dear. It was no bequest. It was not in the will. He only told me, and that but once, that he should wish his nephew to have his watch, but it need not have been binding if I had not chose it. Now, we also learn how keen Lady Denham is for her Denham namesake to marry into money. And she'll scheme away to make sure that it happens and to keep him away from girls of small fortune such as Charlotte. If we could but get 
a young heiress to Sanderton. But heiresses are monstrously short. I do not think we have had an heiress here since Sanderton has been a public place. Families come after families. But as far as I can learn, it's not one in a hundred of them that have any real property, landed or funded. An income, perhaps, but no property. Clergymen, maybe, or lawyers from town, or half-pay officers, or widows with only a jointure. And what good can such people do anybody? Except they take our empty houses, and between ourselves, I think they're great fools for not staying at home. Now, if we could get a young heiress to be sent here for her health, and if she were ordered to drink ass's milk, I could supply her. And as soon as she got well, have her fall in love with Sir Edward. That would be very fortunate indeed. Now, we also learn that Diana, in her anxiety to find new visitors to Santerton, has not succeeded in attracting two groups, but just Mrs Griffiths with three ladies from her seminary, a finishing school, but in reality a husband-finding service, mm. <laughs> that West Indian mixed-race heiress Felicity Lamb, uh, maybe hidden away in Sanderton somewhere, and the two Beaufort sisters, Letitia and Leah, in search of husbands to keep them in the manner to which they wish to become accustomed to. So what sort of thing would Mrs Griffiths teach at this finishing school then? Ladies, if you please. Nice hat. Mrs. Griffiths, finishing school of etiquette and fashion, will find us a husband of rank, breeding, and distinction. We'll learn the skill. wives and mothers reading writing sewing and the very very best of manners we'll learn all about rank presidents and titles and knowing where our place belongs when going into dinner how to talk to a bore about nothing at all and what of a duke or a marquis. We'll learn about introductions, who to present to whom. Don't talk to a gentleman if not formally introduced. And go to town with company. So we cannot be
that. He looks young enough. That's Arthur Parker, the youngest of the three Parker brothers. Does he have any money? I believe so. Has he come for a cure? He and his two sisters spent their whole lives searching for cures for illnesses they haven't got. Ah, yes. So he's young and he has money. What's not to like? Do you have to ask? <laughs> yes, well, in a seaside town full of quack cures, I have the perfect answer. Let's see what happens if I can get him on the equine metasystemic methodology of Dr. Muscovy. <laughs> what? Isn't it obvious? Well, not no, really. not really. I, who? Let's Fern, is this another weird Muscovy. one? Metasystemic. Okay. Let's go. 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 Let's go.
much more observant than Mary. When entering the gates of Sanderton House, she catches sight of something going on behind the boundary fence. Miss Clara Brereton, seated apparently very composedly, and Sir Edward Denham by her side. Well, they were sitting so near each other and appeared so closely engaged in gentle conversation that Charlotte instantly felt she had nothing to, to do but step back again and say not a word. The privacy was certainly their object. It could not but strike her rather unfavourably with regard to Clara, though hers was a situation which must not be judged with severity. Amongst other moralising points of reflection which the sight of this tete-a-tete -tete produced, Charlotte could not but think of the extreme difficulty which secret lovers must have in finding a proper spot for their stolen interviews. Here, perhaps, they had thought themselves so perfectly secure from observation. The whole field stretched out before them, and a steep bank in pails never crossed by the foot of man to their back, and a great thickness of the air in aid. And yet here, she had seen them. They really were ill-used. simple things in life are best away from the smell of horses where the air is clean and the songbirds sing and the sheep may graze in the meadows oh, oh I, I do love, love living by the sea there's salt in the air that's for me there's no finer place to be than living by the blue briny sea loves in the air all the round the hairs in the meadow just abound there's no place I'd rather be than living by the blue briny sea. Town is busy and fun, the theatre, the balls and courting, but I feel confined. As I've just outlined, the sea areas are calling. Oh, I do love living by the sea. The salt in the air, that's for me. There's no finer place to be than living by the blue briny sea. Loves in the air all around, the hairs in the meadow just abound. There's no place I'd rather be than living by the blue briny sea. Clambering along from the shore, along from the shore. down from the cliffs high above, golden sand all around, the crashing waves resound. Seagulls climb and soar. The rock pools yield their harvest. Fresh fish from the sea. So wonderful and marvelous. Oh, I do love living by the sea. The salt in the air, that's for me. There's no finer place to be than living by the blue briny sea. The Loves in the air all around, the hairs in the meadow just abound. There's no place I'd rather be than living by the blue bloody sea. Oh, I do love living by the sea. Well, they seem to be getting on well together. But in the society world of the Regency, where physical contact is closely monitored between young couples, how was Charlotte to get Sydney to sweep her off her feet? We'll see later. But what of Clara? Anna Lefroy provides us with her backstory, but nothing about how her past actions would direct her future. Charlotte takes the opportunity to take a turn on the veranda to try to get to know her. I had such an interesting time at Sanderton House today. Such a well-proportioned house, with some really good paintings and, of course, being regaled with all of that chocolate in the drawing room. <laughs> you had just come in from a walk when we were on the tour of the house. I believe I caught sight of you when I was walking down the drive with Mrs Parker. And did you also catch sight of Sir Edward? I did. Yeah, he, he did stop to speak to me. And? But please don't tell Lady Denham. Just don't tell anyone. 
Shall we take a turn on the veranda? So this is in the strictest confidence, just you and me. Oh, count on it. In this resort of elderly hypochondriacs, us young ladies have to stick together. You must understand my situation here ain't safe. If I fail to please Lady Denham, she can send me back to the East End, but she's got plenty more poor relations she could choose to take my place. All right, yeah, he did stop to speak to me. Oh, I just got so tired of always looking behind me, looking out for well-laid traps of men, a life of living but only just surviving, not being able to just relax and not pretend. Making a break for the exit, breaking out. Very bold of you. What would Lady Denham have said? It was just our regular morning walk, but sometimes Lady Denham chooses not to come with me. Quite frequently, in fact. Oh, she's becoming more and more obsessed that the servants are stealing the silver. Every week she makes them get it out so she can count it, tick it off her list. What am I to do if <laughs> Sir Edward's out riding and stops to speak to me? Oh, but he was so strange and confusing. Ah, I expect he was quoting Robbie Burns to you. Oh, pale, pale now those rosy lips. I have to kiss the fondly. <laughs> so that's what he was talking to you about the other day then. Lascivious poetry. Well, he was trying to, the poor man, but I think I got the better of him. Is that what you mean by strange and confusing? <laughs> My dear Charlotte, if one can keep one's virtue as an orphan girl in Whitechapel, one can surely be more than a match for the Sir Edwards of this world. No, just much more strange and confusing than that. He said he wanted to talk to me because he was really concerned about Lady Denham, like especially about her health, like how she should be going so careful about what she ate in case it should disagree with her, how she should always take a stick when she walked about, how she should be so careful when she went anywhere in a carriage so she wouldn't have a, an accident like Mr Parker. Lady Denham's companion and I have tried to be of every assistance to the old lady, frequently assisting the cook with the buying of provisions and well, being Lady Denham's walking companion whenever she went out. What did Mr Edward say to that?
let's have a plot recap. Charlotte wants to marry Sydney, mm -hmm. but it would have to be a love match because Sydney wouldn't be marrying for money or a higher place in society. And the sexually frustrated and shallow Sir Edward Denham would marry the gorgeous Clara, if he could. <laughs> Clara thinks that compared to her suitors in the East End, Sir Edward would be quite the catch. Uh, the snag, though, is that Sir Edward doesn't have control over his own estate until he inherits it on the death of Lady mm -hmm. Denham. And Clara has no money. Unless, of course, Lady Denham dies in test it, mm -hmm. in which case she stands to inherit one quarter of her estate. So, they both stand to benefit greatly from the old lady's death, both financially and matrimonially. Meanwhile, Lady Denham is trying to get her nephew engaged to the West Indian heiress, Miss Lamb, and we suspect that she is in cahoots with the white English trustees that control Miss Lamb's fortune until she is 21. Lady Denham is so full of conceit, though, that she tries to persuade Clara to talk up Sir Edward's merits with Miss Lamb, whilst also suggesting to Sir Edward that Miss Lamb would welcome his advances in one of the bathing machines. Ooh. Clara enlists the support of Charlotte in trying to come up with a scheme to thwart Lady Denham and approach Miss Lamb to find out what she wants in life. Charlotte was brought up the daughter of a gentleman farmer and the oldest of 14 children. Clara was orphaned at 10 years old. So now Felicity Lamb tells us her backstory.
say the color of its skin but if the women of the world unite we can choose the causes we will fight and we Slave trade is dead, but that does not mean the slaves are free, and for that I must work. I doubt I will ever marry. A picnic is arranged on the beach with opportunities for sea bathing. Clara distracts attention with a game of spillikins, and Charlotte and Felicity make their way to the bathing machines. Charlotte to the blue machine, Felicity to the red. Sir Edward Denham sneaks away from the beach party and enters Felicity's sea bathing machine. Felicity screams and jumps into the water and there is lots of sounds of splashing. We hear Charlotte shout, don't row for Felicity, I'll save you, and jumps after Felicity. Sydney rushes into the water. Felicity emerges spluttering, there is a man in my cabin. Oh, okay. No, I just got out of there as quickly as I could. And Sydney then shouts, well, where's Charlotte? And dives deeper into the water. In all the confusion, Sir Edward Denham sneaks away unobserved. <laughs> Sydney emerges carrying Charlotte in his arms. Suspicion falls on Sir Edward. A cloud of disgrace hangs over him, but nothing is proved. Lady Denham's scheme is foiled. You silly fool, you could have drowned. <coughs> Felicity grew up on an island. She swims like a fish, but you can't swim. Now, I know you don't like me very much, but they are not the only ones whose lives have not been easy. My father was a grocer. I used to serve in his shop. I was pretty. My mother died, and I was an only child. A silly thing they said, but pretty. Mr. Hollis, a rich man, married me when he sold the factory, when he retired and bought his land upon the coast. Nouveau riche and parvenu in society, one does what one needs to see. Left alone when my husband died, I married Sir Harry Denham for his title. But old money didn't like me, not the proper pedigree for minor aristocracy. Ah, yes, that word, inspiration, again. Jane Austen's brother Henry was a partner in the bank of Austen, Maud and Tilson, which failed in 1816. Jane was staying in London with her brother Henry, preparing Mansfield Park and Emma for publication when she experienced firsthand why a bank fails and how. So then, in 1817, Austen starts writing a novel about 
property building and speculation at a sea bathing resort without any visitors. Where was Tom Parker buying his land from? Most probably buying it from Lady Denham and borrowing the money from the Bank of Eastbourne to do so. They most probably have accounts in the same bank. And as Tom's overdraft increases, Lady Denham's deposit account gets bigger and bigger. Everyone can see seaside resorts will become popular, and now might be a good time to invest if one can buy in cheaply. Nothing like a banking crisis to create some cheap buying opportunities, eh? If only Mr Tracy can engineer it. Tom Parker gets advance notice of Mr Tracy's plans when Mr Woodcock, the owner of the hotel, pays him a late night visit to Trafalgar House to relay a conversation that he's overheard. But, but Mr. Mr. Tracy needs Sydney's help. Let me tell you about addiction. I love the way it drags folk down, makes them open to collusion. Kicking others as they drown. Now, Tracy has a scheme to make them both rich, robbing a bank by causing outrageous panic and getting people to go back and queue to get their money back quick so they can buy in on the cheap. The chief clerk, however, is in Tracy's pocket and he's been discounting dodgy bills. Always handy having someone on the inside, eh? The bank would be forced to call in its loans, causing mayhem. Action as at the Bank of Uddle and Falstaff in Eastport. Sydney knows it well, realising that Tracy ain't in Sanditon for the love of fresh sea air, and actually, it's Lady Denham's money he's after. Come, you can join in our fast action, giving people what they need to drag them down. Don't can cultivate corruption, making money quick. Sandy Town. So, this is why Mr. Tracy needs Sydney's help to persuade Lady Denham to withdraw all of her assets. Sydney soon realises, however, that it's the people he cares about that are going to suffer at the hands of Tracy's scheme. With the pound notes in their pocket, good for nothing. After all, Sandton has changed Sydney for the better, so he's done with all the dodgy schemes. He denies Mr. Tracy's offer, threatens him. Go on, do your worst. Do you know what? I'll get to Lady Denham and I'll warn her first. Come, you can join in our fast action, giving people what they need to drag them down. Don't you call to vague corruption, making money quick. Sandy Town. Sydney warns Lady Denham not to try and withdraw all her money from the Eastbourne Bank, but she doesn't listen. And then one morning she comes bursting into Trafalgar House in deep dudgeon. Excuse me, excuse me. No, no. How dare you? How dare you? Dishonoured, dishonoured, a draft of mine not paid. Dishonoured, dishonoured, the news I have today. My new barouche Landau, for that I cannot pay. Calm yourself, dear lady, I cannot comprehend what you have to say. You're the richest all amongst us gathered here today. This I don't understand, your paper money should be fine. But did you also go to the bank and ask them to pay their gold away? Morning I tried to draw a thousand guineas from their vault. I came away with fifty. If I wanted bullion, they said they'd get it. But if I wanted it now, they said it wasn't their fault. You can't have been pleased, but others in the banking parlour, did they see what went on and understand all the palaver? The bank, it must have failed. There were queues last afternoon. They'll fall for bankruptcy, we'll hear the news soon. It all works fine if folks have confidence, believe in God that they can trust. The folks in charge do know what they're doing and be fair and just. But when the smoke clears and the mirrors crack, you realise the whole damn thing is bust. Dishonoured, dishonoured, my liquid 
fortune gone. Dishonor, 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 dishonor. Let it die. You'll get some of it back when the trustees in bankruptcy deduct all their fees and have some fun. They'll call in all my loans to try and pay you back. You sand it and it's ruined. It's dead and on the rack. I can lend you a hundred pounds in gold on the notes of another bank by a way of a mortgage on Sanditon House. Dishonor, dishonor, dishonor. Mr. Tracy's right. Dishonor, dishonor, dishonor. dishonor. I'm ready for a fight. It's your bad business that has brought me and the bank down. And now you want security as part of your big shakedown. and the property securing the loans will be sold for whatever it can fetch. Depositors might eventually get back a small percentage of their savings. And then Tracy goes to Lady Denham, blame is Sydney and Tom, and seeking to be the agent for the recovery of her money, but it's just all too much for Lady Denham and she has an heart attack. Clara and Sir Edward suspect each other of murdering Lady Denham. Yeah. Sir Edward, because Mr Tracy told him he'd done a background check on Clara for a client named Mrs Dawes, oh. where he discovered that Clara's mother most likely died of cyanide poisoning at the hands of Clara's yeah. stepfather in order to claim on an insurance policy. A very common event in the East End. Relieved that none of them are in fact murderers, <laughs> Sir Edward asks Clara to marry him, and she accepts. This <laughs> means that... Clara and Sir Edward will inherit Lady Denham's wealth. Yes. Which is not what Mr Tracy wants, because then they could outbid him on the assets coming on the market following the bankruptcy of the partners of the Eastbourne Bank. Mr Tracy finds circumstantial evidence that Lady Denham was poisoned to try and lock them up. But Sydney finds a medical expert to prove that this is not the case. Tom is made bankrupt, but Sydney buys up his assets for two shillings on the pound. And Clara... Sir Edward, Felicity, Sydney, Diana, Susan and Arthur all invest in the resort, which proves to be very successful and popular. The 19th century cast really could see the future. You know what, Fern? I actually really enjoyed that. Yeah. 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 Well, thanks, guys. So, what did you think? Well, it's all there, isn't it, in the book. Austin wrote in these characters with whom we can all connect with and the themes that we write about today, like race, equality, feminism, mm. speculation, mm. medicine, yeah. banking crises and <laughs> business scandals. And uh, I think that um, some of us, here she comes, have uh, really enjoyed getting dressed up in the old costumes, oh, haven't we? Yeah, what you mean? <laughs> 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 to drag you away Don't from that think I'd like to wear it every day, though. No, no, no. No. Yeah. I managed to get some <laughs> cracking social media footage. Whoa, 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 don't you dare. Just run it by me first, yeah. Really? Would it, mate? But it's just so true, guys. One cannot truly appreciate everything we have today if we haven't seen how far we've come in the past 200 years. Mm -hmm. See? Told you you'd enjoy it, didn't I? <laughs> you just had to give it a go. Hey, Bill. You didn't know you could sing like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Thanks, man. <laughs> Thanks, guys. <laughs> um, there is one song we haven't sung yet. If you guys what? fancy it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what are you waiting for? Go on then. <laughs> it's sung by our 19th century characters. Mm -hmm. And it's about all the good things that have happened in the past 200 years. 
as exemplified by holidays and leisure and the growth of seaside resorts. Things they could have only dreamed of 200 years ago. And it's called I Can See the Future. I can see the future, it's a great and 